let me recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. DeSantis. But, uh, the priorities are related to, to your failure to remove these folks because you say, oh, they're priority two, we'll still get to them. The fact is, of those 66,000, when we got the individual offenses, you did have people convicted of homicide that were released. You had people convicted of sexual assault, rape child molestation, really, really significant crimes. And to say they're court decisions, that's a rationalization for why you released it, but you did release them, and that's putting the public at risk. And so um, I second the chairman's concern about that. And the fact of the matter is I was a prosecutor, particularly with some of the child molestation stuff. You do plead that down. Some prosecutors do because you don't want to put the child on the stand. And so they end up with, with offenses that could probably be considered priority two, and that's putting the American people at risk. But I digress. Ms. Richard, uh, you were quoted recently as saying that the biggest myth is people coming here could be terrorists in relation to the Syrian refugee um, situation. Um, you know, why are you so dismissive of the possibility that they're going to have terrorists um, in the refugee flow? I am not dismissive of the idea that terrorist organizations Well, you said it was a myth. To Why'd you say it was a myth I, then? I don't remember saying that. Um, you but, said the biggest myth is that people coming could be terrorists, and your point was that they're likely to be fleeing terrorists. But the, the point, issue is is that if you have 10,000 people, I mean, even if 99% of them are you know, no threat, you know, 1%, that's a significant number of people that would be injected um, into our society. We just saw recently two refugees linked to the Paris attack were arrested in an Austrian refugee camp. And you'll acknowledge, would, will you not, that we have had refugees come to this country who have been prosecuted for material support to terrorism, correct? Correct. You will acknowledge that? Yeah. Because we had a number of them just this year. Um, you know, the Eastern District of Virginia, Laban Haji Muhammad. You had Abbasin or Mohammed Abraham, uh, Abraham from Western District of Texas. Um, a lot of these people came as refugees. Some then ended up getting LPR status, some even citizenship. Uh, but the fact of the matter is these are folks who have come through the program and have gone to terrorism. Let me ask you this. What is your appraisal of how uh, the Somali refugee in, in, community in Minnesota um, has worked out for the interests of the United States? What, what I wanted to say was that most, all bona fide refugees are people who are fleeing terrible things, including terrorists. Well, that's the point, though. I think a lot of us are, are, are concerned that, that we can't tell the difference between a bona fide refugee, given what the FBI director has said and given what other very high officials had said. Um, so I take that point. But what about the situation with the Somali refugees um, in Minneapolis? There's a thousands have settled there over, over the last 20 years. Um, we know that uh, there's very high rates of cash assistance and, and food assistance paid for by the taxpayer. And here's the thing. You've had over 50 people from that community go to join ISIS or al-Shabaab or other terrorist groups in the Middle East. Is that something that's in the United States' interest? No, it's not. Uh, well, US how did it end up happening? To al and, and to ISIS and to ISIL. Well, how did it end up happening then? This, to me, is the key question why anyone would be attracted by ISIL or al Shabaab. People born in the United States, people who are uh, converts to, to this, these fallings, people who are um, uh, refugees who came into the United States. So you're not sure why it happens? I, I think this is a key question for all of us. So here, what is the attraction? But here's why your, what your statement bothered me, because what I think the Somali experience in Minnesota shows, a lot of the people who were coming directly when they were adults were not necessarily involved in terrorism and did not pursue terrorism. They got to the United States, but then they have the families, and you have the second generation. You have U.S. citizens. So their choice... They could have grown up in Somalia, and they draw, draw the biggest, you know, the, uh, it's like a royal flush to be able to grow up in America. And given all that, how do they thank the United States? They go join the jihad. So the point is... I agree with you 100%. Well, here's this the is point, what though. keeps me awake at night. Why would it, someone who grows up in the United States be attracted to this? But here's the point. The refugee policies that we have, even getting beyond the vetting initially... You're having to essentially try to figure out what's going to happen 10, 20 years down the road. And so the folks that we're bringing in now, um, we don't know what the downstream effects are that going to be. And so when I see something like what's happened in Somalia, it gives me a lot of cause for concern. Mr. Rodriguez, let me ask you this. I, we got Tashfin Malik's... Uh, 
she executed uh, when she was applying for her K-1 visa. She was asked, there's a question on there basically saying, are you a terrorist? Check yes or no. Um, is that really the best that we can do? Because I think even from her perspective, I don't even think she has to lie because she probably doesn't consider herself to be a terrorist. I think you're, you're referring to the consular interview. I will talk about what, uh, what we know and what we uh, think we need to do. For example, in the refugee screening process, we develop lines of questioning as part of the interview uh, that go beyond just what might appear in a mere form and actually So you're in the process of developing that? No, no, that exists. That's existed for, for, for years. Uh, and those are being reinforced based on What about on her adjustment application? Uh, they it, asked that question. That, uh, unless there is a, 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 under current practice, unless there is a specific trigger, uh, some derogatory information that would lead us to probe into those kinds of issues, uh, we don't, obviously that's one of the things we need to be thinking well, see, about. See, I now. think, you know, this is somebody who, obviously we know that there was um, statements that she had been making over the internet. She's traveling from uh, Pakistan and, and, and Saudi Arabia. Those are hotbeds of Salafist uh, ideology. Um, very, very dicey uh, when you start talking about individuals. Uh, Ms. Bond, is the State Department rec recommending that Congress, do you guys need us to change any laws so that we can have a system that would screen out people like Tashfeen Malik? We do have laws that would screen out people like Tashfeen So you don't think Malik that there don't need we, to be any changes? If we identify them, and we are looking at But that's my point. Does Congress need to give you authority or change policy in any way so that they are identified? Obviously, if they are identified, I hope they wouldn't be let in. I mean, that would be to me. So, but we're not identifying everybody now. And the question is, is this just kind of bureaucratic mistakes, or do we need to change policies? Do you have recommendations for us? I, I would not at this moment, but I think uh, based on the review that we're uh, looking at now, it's possible that some of the ideas that we generate might require a change in the law. Thank you. I yield back.